All right, hello to our friends joining us via recording. We are wrapping up lesson number six about the central dogma. So whiplash here, we're gonna go fast. Where we picked up or where we ended last time was uh, looking at these differences. So DNA is what our cells start with. Uh, we, we have our DNA in our nucleus. It stores our genetic information for us. We make RNA to get the message out of the nucleus so that we can use it to build proteins. So when we're talking about the central dogma, uh, I guess I don't have a picture again for us here. Uh, let's, let's do a little writing. Remember that the, in the central dogma, we start with our DNA and we turn that DNA into mRNA. That's what we talked about on Monday. Once that DNA has turned into mRNA, now I need to turn it into a protein. That's what I'm trying to get to when I, I do the central dogma. I wanna to get to a protein. So going from RNA into a protein is doing the process of translation. So when we talk about translation, the process you use to actually build your proteins, this is gonna happen at our ribosomes. Remember from the class session on Monday, we, we have two organelles inside our cells that, that build proteins. One of them are these small little ribosomes. So some ribosomes are floating around in the soup, the cytosol, Others of them are attached to that organelle called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Regardless of which organelle we're at, the process of building proteins is always the same. So we start with our mRNA molecule, our messenger RNA that has the directions for the protein we want to build. That gets to a ribosome. When that message gets to the ribosome, the ribosome is going to read it. But ribosomes aren't very good at reading. When ribosomes are trying to figure out what, what the message says, they have to use these little things called codons. And I want you to underline, highlight, star in your notes outline, codons. Hey, uh, help me out in the chat. What page do we have this picture? or what page do we have information about translation on? Okay, see on page number five. Perfect, okay. So on page number five, we've got information about translation. Find that word codon and underline, highlight, star it. These are a set of three letters in the RNA that our ribosomes use to read the message. So a codon, this, this, ribosome, the, this ribosome is looking at the genetic information. It finds a set of three letters. It reads those three letters and says, for example, A-U-G. So it reads those letters and the ribosome is like, okay, who can tell me what A-U-G means? And when it's calling out these, these letters, we have that other kind of RNA that we talked about called tRNA tRNA says, oh yeah, I know what that means. tRNA has this bottom part down here where it has nucleotides, where it has letters. Its letters help it to interpret, or we could say to translate, what the message in the mRNA means. So my ribosome says, I've got a message, AUG, and this tRNA molecule that's attached to a particular amino acid says, oh, I can help you out here. I know what this means. So the, the tRNA comes into the ribosome, bringing its little amino acid with it, and it comes down inside and reads the sequence right here. Now the ribosome is like, sweet, I know what AUG means. Now I'm gonna read the next set of letters, CGC. Okay, who knows what CGC means? And a different tRNA molecule with, new, with a different kind of nucleotides down here says, I know what that means, I can help you out it's attached to a different amino acid, brings it in and helps the ribosome read CGC. So this process goes on and on. The ribosome looks at the letters three at a time, and then it goes down the genetic information, looks at the three letters, gets the right tRNA that brings with it the amino acid, moves on, looks at the letters, so on and so forth. 
So when we have a ribosome that's reading a whole piece of mRNA, so we see our mRNA up here, big important ideas. Idea number one, we have to read it in codons. We have to read it in sets of three because if it's more than three letters or less than three letters, we're all confused. It doesn't work. Big idea number two, tRNA, the thing that's technically called transfer RNA, but I told you to call it translator RNA. tRNA is, is a bridge. It helps us to take the letters that we see here and turn those letters into amino acids. So my mRNA gets to the ribosome. The ribosome tries to read it. tRNA acts as a translator going from the language of letters to the language of amino acids. And from there, we can build a protein. Hey, remind me in the chat, we talked about a specific kind of chemical bond that my ribosomes would build to connect together these amino acids. What was the name of the special kind of chemical bond that I find in proteins that connects my amino acids together? Exactly. Yep, several of us chiming in. The special kind of chemical bond that my ribosomes will use to connect these to each other is called a peptide bond. So I'm going to bounce back a picture here. As we have this big long chain of amino acids up here, what's holding them together are the peptide bonds. So a, a tRNA molecule comes in with its amino acid, it gives its amino acid to the ribosome. The ribosome says, oh, I know where you go. I'm going to attach you right here. I'm going to build you a peptide bond and we'll keep on going. When we're talking about the codons, the three letter sequences that we have in, in our RNA that ribosomes can read, there's two important kinds of codons we want to make sure we know about. The first important codon is this one right here, the start codon. The start codon, there's only one of them. It's these three letters up here, A, U, G. Every time a piece of RNA goes to a ribosome, the ribosome starts to look and look and look until it finds A, U, G. That tells it where we start to build the protein. So outside of the scope of our class, but in other biology classes, you'll talk about how we have to put stuff in front of AUG to make sure that the RNA doesn't fall apart. The ribosome doesn't read the other stuff, it starts reading right here. So the start codon is the first set of three letters that the ribosome calls out and gets a tRNA molecule to come there. The first amino acid we put in every single one of the proteins in your body is always methionine. That's always the first one because my tRNA that reads AUG is attached to methionine, MET. The other kind of codon that we need to make sure we're familiar with are the things called stop codons. Stop codons, like their name suggests, tell my cell it's time to stop doing translation. So we might have some extra letters after the stop codon, again, to keep the RNA stable, but the only ones that we're supposed to put in amino acids for are everything that's in front of a stop codon. So your proteins all normally have a stop codon in them when we're done building the protein itself. But things get a little bit dicey when a stop codon shows up in the right place in the wrong place. So if I'm reading my RNA strand and I get to this codon here, UGA. If I'm a ribosome I call out UGA and no tRNA molecules say, oh, I can tell you what that means. And I'm like, okay, someone help me out here. UGA, what does this mean? No tRNA molecules help me interpret it. I call it out one more time. When nobody helps me as a ribosome, I freak out and I split in, in half. So ribosomes are made of more than one piece. When we get to a stop codon, the ribosomes fall apart they can't get the help that they need to interpret the codon. So stop codons help our, our cells to know when to stop building a protein. 
But also, if I put them in the wrong place, I'm going to stop reading at that point, and I might not build a whole protein. So it's really important that those stop codons are only where I want them to be. Before I move on, are there any questions or things we want to clarify in the chat? I have one. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the word um, amino acid interchangeable with codon because I, I was reading somewhere it's saying what brings amino acid to the ribosome and I'm thinking at that point they're only uh, like nucleic acids so are those words used inter interchangeably or do they become amino acids once they, you know, on the picture you were showing, they spat out of, uh, uh, they meet the anticodon and then they spat out of the ribosome. When does it become amino acids? Yeah, so the amino acids are right here. So amino acids are those things that we talked about last week in lesson number five. So remember, we've got 20 of them. Uh, this one is methionine. Next door, you see one called proline or serine. All of those are amino acids all the time. The amino acids will attach to, to these molecules here. This whole thing together is what we call the tRNA. So tRNA is made of two different, two different things. It has those uh -huh. letters, it has the nucleotides, but it also has the amino acids like we talked about. So tRNA, the reason it can be a translator, the reason it can help us to go from the letters, the codons in our RNA, into an amino acid is because it has these two parts. So codon, that word codon, you only ever use that when we're talking about the RNA. I RNA see. has codons. It has these sets of three letters that the ribosome needs to read. We need to turn those codons into amino acids and the way that we do that is using the tRNA molecule. So the, the, the one that brings the amino acids to the ribosome is the tRNA. Correct. Yep. So when we look at our picture here, our ribosome is brown. Our ribosome will attach to the mRNA. And the mRNA is made up of all these little codons. When we are reading the mRNA, it's these tRNA molecules that help us to interpret it and how they help us interpret it is because of these amino acids. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, great clarifying question. Yeah, so Danae asked another important clarifying question, and I want to pose it to the class as well. Uh, what do we think would happen if my stop codon is in the wrong place? Does anyone remember we talked a little bit? If I put that stop codon in the wrong place, yeah, so if my stop codon is in the wrong place, I have a mutation. That's totally right. And if I, so, so let's do a scenario here. Let's say instead of my stop codon being codon number nine, let's say that my stop codon is up here. Let's say I mutated it and suddenly my stop codon is here number four. So Dusty, mentioned something falls apart when I get to a stop codon. Do we remember what is it that falls apart when we get to a stop codon? Who freaks out when I when I hit a stop codon? Yeah, exactly. Diana right. is absolutely right. It's the ribosomes. Whenever, it doesn't matter where in the mRNA sequence, wherever I hit a stop codon, my ribosome is, is done. It, it's going to fall apart. We're not reading the RNA anymore. Uh, so at that point, I stop building my protein. So what I've built so far stays together. It's totally fine. So I might have the right amino acid for number one, for codon number one, number two, number three. I've got the right amino acids for there. But once I hit four, if I made this a stop codon, I'm falling apart. I'm not putting in this, and I'm not even reading any of this. So I stop building my protein the moment I hit a stop codon. 
So if I put a stop codon in too early, I'm going to I'm not going to build a complete protein. I'm not going to to put in what I was supposed to put in. So whatever I've built so far is good. It's been built. But anything after that point is is not going to get read. I'm not going to build that. So big idea to take away from stop codons. We only want them in the places they're supposed to be. If I put them anywhere else, I'm not going to finish making my protein. Absolutely, like Danae, Danae said, it, it's just going to be incomplete. I'm not going to build the whole protein, which means, hey, my, my anatomy is going to be wrong. Do we think I'm going to still have the right physiology? Yes or no? If I stop my protein early, is it still going to be able to do its job? What do we think? Exactly right. Y'all are picking up on the most important question of this semester, right? If the structure's wrong, the function's wrong. So we've got to keep those stop codons in the right place or we're going to have the wrong structure. You will notice on the homework assignment that I'm going to give you an RNA sequence and I'm going to ask you to turn it into an amino acid sequence. I'm going to ask you to do translation. Unfortunately, you can't just call out to tRNA molecules and have them do the work for you, right? You're going to have to do it yourself. So you, the way that we as people interpret RNA to figure out what amino acid we'd be putting in to a sequence is using this thing we see up here. So this is called the genetic code table. I'm going to type that and, and not try to write it all. <laughs> the genetic code table. On the homework, on quizzes, on exams, I promise I will give you the genetic code table. Do not memorize it. My goal is not to have you memorize this table. I'll give it to you, so you need to know how to use it to, uh, to be able to succeed. So let's pretend uh, that I gave you this, uh, this uh, RNA sequence. Uh, I'm, I'm making things up, so hopefully I didn't do anything too funky. Okay. The way it works anytime you're doing translation is first you take your RNA and you split it into groups of three. Hey, remind me in the chat, what was the name of these groups of three letters? That's, that's all that a ribosome can read, these little groups of three. Exactly. Yep, so these little groups of three are codons. When you get an RNA sequence, the first thing you do is chop it up into codons. Hey, by the way, what letter in that sequence tells me I'm looking at RNA and not DNA? What's the letter that, that only RNA has? DNA doesn't have it, right? Just RNA. Exactly. Yep, that letter U. Anytime you see a U, it's always RNA. So I've got a sequence. It has the letter U. I know that means that I'm looking at RNA. I've split it up into codons. Now I need to use this crazy table to help me figure out what's going on. So my first codon is A U G. I'm going to get my pointer back instead of my pen. OK, so when we look at these codons, my first letter is this column right here. So my first letter is A. I know that what I'm looking for is somewhere in this row right here. OK, my first letter is A. My second letter is what's along the top up here. So here's that letter U. So I've got A and U so far. Now, if I want to, I can go all the way over to the right to see that third letter, or I can just look in the box that they gave me. A, U, G codes for methionine. Remember, every single one of, of our proteins starts with A, U, G, methionine. So if I'm doing translation, I've translated the first codon. The first codon 
tells me that I started my amino acid chain with methionine. I've done one, perfect. Now I'm gonna move on to my next codon. My next codon is CCA. So I go over on my table, here's row C, it's somewhere in here. I go to the top, here's C. Now I'm somewhere inside here, CCA. My next one is the amino acid called, oops, called proline. Proline. Now, when we're looking at proline, when we're looking at this box right here, this teaches us an important idea about the genetic code table. So somewhere in your notes, you're going to see the word degenerate. Can anyone tell me what page in your notes you have the question? It says the genetic code is degenerate. What does that mean? Do we know what page that's on? Okay, I'm seeing page seven. Okay, so genetic code is degenerate. Here's what that means. It means that more than one codon, more than one RNA sequence will, can sometimes lead to the correct amino acid. So we were translating this codon right here, CCA. CCA gives us proline. That's what we want. We want to put that one in there. But let's say that RNA polymerase got a little bit sloppy and instead of doing CCA, it put in, it did CCU. Even though we have this incorrect base pair here at the end, we still end up with proline. That's good news for us. Or if I ended up with CCC, if RNA polymerase made it wrong and put in a C or a G, any of those, those combinations, any of those codons lead to the same amino acid. When I say that the genetic code table is degenerate, it means that you have a little bit of room for error. Yeah, like Amush mentioned in the chat, the, the code is redundant. There's more than one uh, set of letters, more than one codon that will lead to the correct amino acid. Now, that is not always true. Let's, let's check over here at this box next door. Maybe instead of my codon is supposed to be CCA, maybe it was supposed to be CAA. Let's say that this is what my codon was supposed to be, CAA. Notice how if that's my codon, I'm supposed to put in a glutamine, GLN, CCA. But if my, my RNA polymerase got a little bit sloppy, and instead of doing CAA, it did CAC, notice that this time it's not the same. This time it has switched. Or say I was supposed to do CAA, and instead of doing CAA, I did CGA. Notice how that also doesn't lead to the same amino acid. So when I say that the code is degenerate, I don't mean that anything goes, that I can make all kinds of errors and it definitely won't be a problem but it does mean that I have a little bit of wiggle room for errors. That wiggle room in particular has to do with the last base in my codon. So the last base in my codon is called the wobble base. I put it in the chat, the wobble base, as in wobble baby, wobble baby, wobble baby base. If I was in class, you would see that I, I cannot dance, but I pretend. <laughs> the last nucleotide in a codon is called the wobble base. If we have any chance of getting the right amino acid, when we have an error, it has to be the wobble base. It has to be the last one. And even if it is the last one, that's not even a guarantee like we saw right here. That's not even a guarantee that we're gonna get the right one. So the last one, the only option, my wobble base can change, I'm more likely to get the right amino acid. If I change anything else, I'm going up a row or I'm going over a column and my chances of getting the right amino acid are much lower. So the degenerate code means there are multiple ways to get to the same answer, but the, it, 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 within reason, it has to be that wobble base that's changing. 
I know I saw a question earlier in the chat that I, I did not uh, look at um, or I didn't mention. The question in the chat asked me where I got my codons from. Can anyone help me with answering that question? Where do you find the codons that we use to help us read this table? Where did we find those codons? Where do we get that information? Exactly, yep. Several of us chiming in, mentioning that the place where the codons come from is the mRNA. So on quizzes or exams, I will give you um, your RNA sequence or um, I would give you a DNA sequence and tell you you need to turn this into RNA. And once you have the RNA, then you can use this table to find those codons. Yeah, so Brianda asked an important question. Her question is, what would happen if the code was not degenerate? What are some thoughts about what might happen in your body if the code was not degenerate? Any ideas? We're making a prediction here, by the way. I didn't I didn't give you this information. What do you would think would happen if the code wasn't degenerate? If we didn't have have the the wiggle room, shall we say? Yeah, so so Moosh mentioned that we would have if we have all these mutations, we're more likely to put in the wrong amino acid. So kind of mix them together. If we have no degenerate code, if we have to be exactly right every time, anytime RNA polymerase makes an error or anytime your DNA gets mutated, anytime that happens, you're in trouble because you're gonna put in the wrong amino acid. So being degenerate helps us have a better chance of um, putting the right amino acid into our protein. It's not that we wouldn't make a protein per se, it's just we'd be way more likely to make the wrong protein. Yeah, so like Caitlin mentioned, we're, we're gonna mess it up. We're gonna build the wrong proteins, absolutely. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna take class time to do this translation with you, but I want to remind you First thing we do when we have an RNA sequence is we always chop it up into codons. So in your notes, when you're getting ready to start translating this, we always start by chopping it up into groups of three, into these little codons. Once you've chopped it up into groups of three, then go back to that genetic code table and use that table to help you figure out which amino acids are being added to the chain. You don't have to know the whole name of amino acids. I'm only ever going to ask you for those abbreviations that you see on the table. So use that table to help you figure out which amino acids go into the chain when we're doing translation. Um, I, I want to mention for you, there's a really awesome video in the guided lesson that shows you the process of transcription and translation please take some time to watch that video. I've listed for you in your notes packets all the steps that are mentioned in that video for building a protein. So from the moment that we, we first need to, to start building our RNA to the moment when we finish building an amino acid chain. Use that video to help you get these steps in order. And it's really awesome to visualize it, not just in like pictures to see it happening in real time. So check that out in the guided lesson. What I want to, to end our class time or our lecture time together is talking with you about what happens when we have an error at some point in the central dogma. So in particular, we're going to talk about what happens uh, in what's called sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease. Individuals with sickle cell anemia have red blood cells that are shaped like sickles. So we're not farming people, most of us probably, <laughs> uh, but when we talk about a sickle, uh, a sickle is, is a, a special kind of tool that can be used to harvest grain. So this is what a sickle would look like and you use it to, to swipe the wheat to, to collect it from the field. So when we talk about sickle cell anemia, 
Uh, it's actually like all those salty banana cells that we've been drawing, right? Your red blood cells are not supposed to look like that. <laughs> They're supposed to look like circles. So in sickle cell anemia, we have a mutation in our DNA. When we mutate our DNA, that changes our RNA, which also changes the amino acid that we put into our protein. So let's look at this. In our normal DNA, the normal sequence that we see is right here, CTC. So someone without the sickle cell trait or without sickle cell anemia, this is their DNA sequence. When we do transcription and turn that DNA into RNA, we get the codon GAG. That's what I build from CTC. When I use my genetic code table to, to translate that RNA, I end up with glutamic acid. So I put in the glue amino acid. For someone who has the mutation for sickle cell anemia, here's something I want to point out. This is just mind blowing to Dr. Aulis. It's only one letter in your entire genome, one letter that's changed. We mutate, instead of having the letter T in that position, we have the letter A. My DNA has a different sequence. So when I go to do the process of transcription to turn that into RNA, now I build an RNA molecule that's GUG. Hey, I changed the, the letter in the middle of my codon. The one in the middle of my codon, that is or is not the wobble base. Was the middle letter in a codon, was that the wobble base? The middle level? level, the middle letter. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it is not the wobble base, right? Uh, several of us mentioning too, Danae mentioning that, that the wobble base is the last one. In sickle cell anemia, I haven't mutated the last one, I've mutated the middle one. When I go to do translation on GUG, instead of getting glutamic acid, now I get valine. Here's the issue with putting valine into this protein. The personality type of glutamic acid is different from the personality type of valine. So when we talk about valine, valine is one of my nonpolar amino acids. When we talk about my, my glutamine, glutamine is polar. When we talk about things that are polar or nonpolar, the biggest difference about these things is how they feel about water. Is it polar or nonpolar things that do like water? Polar or nonpolar? Who likes water? Yeah, exactly. Polar things like water, which means that any of these amino acids that we see here, any of these like water, they want to be by water. The normal protein that I should have made has this amino acid that likes to be by water. Instead of putting in the one that likes to be by water, I'm going to put in one that's nonpolar. Nonpolar things don't like to be around water. I went from one personality type to another personality type. Not only did I put in the wrong amino acid, it's a completely different kind of amino acid. So when we look at the way that, that it works in sickle cell anemia, we start with an error at the primary structure of our protein. Normally, we would have had that glutamic acid in here. Now I've got my nonpolar valine in here. Error at the primary structure level. If I change the order of my amino acids, that's going to change things like my secondary structures, my alpha helices and my beta sheets, or when I fold all of those things together in my tertiary structure, that's gonna change as well. Notice when everything's normal, when I have the right amino acid in there, I've got this nice heart-shaped protein, nice, nice heart-shaped one, but over here, when I put in valine instead of my glutamic acid, here's my underlying highlight star. On your picture, 
of this underline highlight star that I've got an exposed hydrophobic region. Exposed hydrophobic region. Right in here is where I find that valine. And that valine does not like water. Valine doesn't like water. Notice how my whole structure, I don't look like a heart anymore. I kind of like to say that this one looks like an elf shoe. So it's kind of curling up at the end. If I put in the wrong amino acid, my alpha, uh, alpha helices and beta sheets are wrong. When I try to fold them together, I end up with the shoe instead of the heart. When I do my quaternary structure, which remember quaternary structure means there's more than one amino acid chain. When I build my protein, I, I should have clarified, I apologize, we're building the hemoglobin protein, that one in your red blood cells that carries oxygen. I've got a mutation in my sequence for, for the hemoglobin protein. So when I try to put together the four pieces that make up hemoglobin, in normal circumstances, my, my hemoglobin proteins are all going to be by themselves. They're going to look like those pictures that we saw in lesson number five for quaternary structure, where there's four pieces that are all together. There's a bunch of them. They just chill out inside a red blood cell. But if I'm a sickled cell, if I have an exposed hydrophobic region, I don't want to be by water. And my neighboring hemoglobin also has an exposed hydrophobic region. So remember when we were talking about protein structure, how we have those things, I'm gonna type it in the chat, called hydrophobic attractions. Hydrophobic attractions, where you hate water, I hate water, let's squeeze together. That's what's happening in, in this instance right here. Notice how my hemoglobin proteins are all grouping together. They're forming this big line. Instead of just floating around by themselves inside your red blood cells, because I have this region that doesn't like water, when I put in, uh, when I have water all over the place inside my cell, we're going to squeeze together to try to keep the water out. You have this picture in your notes that I feel like does a great job showing you what's going on. In normal circumstances, my hemoglobin molecules all exist by themselves. There's no hydrophobic region. They are perfectly happy. So if, if there's no hydrophobic region, you'll just find them mixed in throughout your red blood cell, your normal red blood cell. But if we have that mutation, all of my hemoglobin proteins have to stick together because they have that part that doesn't like water, that doesn't want to be around water. So when those hemoglobin proteins start to stick together, we end up generating these big long lines of hemoglobin and those big long hemoglobin lines end up building us these red blood cells that look like a sickle. Hey, not a trick question. Do we think that a sickled red blood cell would or would not be able to do the same kinds of things as a normal red blood cell? Is this one over here going to be able to do the same things or not be able to do the same things? Yeah, exactly. Several of us are, are saying in the chat, this would not be able to do the same things. When we think about what red blood cells do, uh, thing number one that they do is they transport oxygen. That oxygen has to attach to these little red dots uh, that are, are my irons inside hemoglobin. If I have to squeeze all of my, my hemoglobin proteins together, I'm not going to be as efficient at, at attaching to oxygen. So that's problem number one. I can't bind as much oxygen. Problem number two is when I'm shaped like this, when I'm sickled, it's a lot harder for me to squeeze through teeny tiny blood vessels and to get to other places in the body. So when someone has sickle cell anemia, they have these things called crises. A crisis happens when our sickled red blood cells block a blood vessel to somewhere in the body. And because the blood has oxygen and nutrients in it, if we block the blood flow to those places, those places literally will start to die. So when a patient who's having a, a sickle cell anemia crisis, they feel incredible pain because their blood vessels are blocked and we're not sending the oxygen and nutrients that we need 
to various places in the body. If sickle cell anemia is something that you're interested in learning more about, current events in anatomy for unit number two, I have a bunch of articles about the way that we're actually using gene therapy to treat sickle cell anemia. So there's some articles that talk about a patient who's actually undergone treatment to change her DNA so that when she trans does transcription and translation on her DNA, she stops making hemoglobin proteins that clump together like this. So if you're interested in learning more, look for that in the current events in anatomy archive because I got some good stuff about her. Her name's Victoria um, and she's seen very promising results, which is awesome. Before I split us up into groups, I want to give us a chance to ask any last minute questions. Any questions about translation or about sickle cell anemia? I need some emojis too. Are you all tracking with me? Is your mind blown? Did you fall asleep? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so Kaylee asked a question about sickle cell. Um, if patients would get transfusions. Uh, yes, that has kind of been our, our go to uh, treatment for sickle cell up until this point where we're starting to try to do gene therapy. Um, yes, so what they would do is, is do transfusions with red blood cells that are not sickled to try to help um, help patients have fewer crises, to try to make sure that they've got the right shape red blood cells floating through their bloodstream. <laughs> I love it. So Shelby sent me a great GIF for, uh, for mind blown. That's perfect. <laughs> and Madison, I love the little, little dancing maracas. That's perfect. All right, well, I'm gonna put a link to our group work here in the chat and I'm going to go ahead and end the recording.